Hi there, and welcome to Journal Club. It is time yet again to take a look at some articles. Uh, today we're going to look at articles uh, that are focusing on sleep and the immune system. These are common questions, and I want to thank Susan Kahn, uh, who uh, suggested uh, uh, me to look at these studies. Uh, she suggested this in a comment on Insom Insom Insight number 147, uh, which is about sleep and health. By the way, before we uh, jump in and look at these studies, um, two announcements, quick announcements. Uh, firstly, uh, this book, uh, <laughs> How to Become a Sleep Coach, is available as an ebook now on Amazon. So if you're interested, check it out. Uh, I said before that I think, you know, it's really for someone who wants to become a sleep coach, but the appendix, which is actually the latter half of the book, is this question and answer section that I think uh, a lot of people can find really helpful, whether you are intending to become a sleep coach or your own coach. Uh, so that was the announcement number one. Number two, I, I just really want to share this, that um, I've already started working on another book. The working title is Stories of Hope. It's probably not going to be called that, but uh, what I'm doing is I, I'm taking, uh, I'm listening to like 35 of the success stories that um, are posted uh, here on this channel. And I'm using the transcript to create, um, you know, basically 35 stories of getting past insomnia with some commentary. And uh, I, I've worked with, I started working with uh, Talking Insomnia number 74, where Nina is a guest. And I, I sense this is becoming really, really good material. You know, she said everything in the interview, but when you see things written like black and white, it's, it's quite powerful. And then so it's just going to be stories with my added commentary. So just want to share that I'm working on that. Uh, it's probably going to take several months before that one is up. But um, anyway, that was that. Let's let's jump in and look at these two articles. Uh, one of them I felt was actually very um, a very good um, article for a journal club. It lends itself well to to you know to take a look at the other one. A little trickier, but anyway, let's take a look here. So I'm going to share my screen, and as I'm doing this, I'm realizing. How am I going to do this? I'm asking myself, but I, I figured it out. Okay, I'm going to do it like this. Okay. So the first one is actually the one we don't want to look at right now. So let's go back and take a look at the other one first. Share screen and um, Chrome tab. And here it is. Okay. So the title of this one is Short Duration of Sleep is Associated with Elevated High Sensitivity C-Reactive Protein Level in Taiwanese adults, a cross-sectional study. And so for those of you who are not familiar with uh, uh, C-reactive protein, uh, it is a very, very common marker used in medicine. And it's basically, the way I think of it, the way I was taught uh, uh, how to use CRP is basically, it's kind of like a, a screening test for any sort of like stress. Um, whether you have a cold or you're anxious or you ran a marathon, you, anything that's a little you know, putting some stress on your body uh, elevates a, this CRP protein. So it's a good kind of screening marker. If the CRP is negative or like within normal levels, it is it is kind of very reassuring. It says if like, oh, if the CRP is normal, then probably nothing is really going on here. If the CRP is elevated, then uh, that just means something is happening. It's very blunt like that. Uh, but so, so that's a little bit about the CRP. And now in the... Uh, First section of this, uh, I guess this is the abstract. They, they they talk about what CRP is, and they say that ele elevated uh, CRP has been associated with inflammation, aging, cancer, adverse outcomes of angina pectoris, coronary artery disease, uh, adverse outcomes of COPD, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they just kind of reaffirming that it's been used uh, that it, it that it has, you know, it's it's used kind of very broadly. And so the intent of this study is the following: so they say. The association of long-term sleep duration with uh, CRP levels is still unclear. Therefore, the aim of the study was to explore the association of mean sleep duration with the risk of elevated a a a CRP in healthy Taiwanese adults. Okay, so what do they do? All right, so they recruit um, 353 healthy um, Taiwanese adults. Let's let's actually read this. Um, study subjects were uh, apparently healthy individuals recruited from uh, from the physical examination center at the regional hospital uh, and CRP levels. And many of the lab tests, of course, were uh, uh, included. Uh, and um, I think 
I just want to jump right into the results, actually. Let's, let's go right there. So here's the, uh, the characteristics of the 353 study participants is shown in table one, which is here. So we can see that uh, you know the average age was 53, average like uh, systolic blood pressure was 131, and this was actually for the males. For females, it was 123, et cetera. And you can see all the things they checked, the heart rate, history of hypertension, diabetes, lipids, smoking, yes or no, alcohol, blah, 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 a lot of things. And here you see mean sleep duration, which for men were like 6.7 hours and 6.5 hours. So the first question in my uh, uh, that comes up to my mind is like, okay, so how did they how did they figure out like um, how, how much these people sleep and for how long did they uh, you know did they measure that? So here it is. The participants were asked for their average uh, daily sleep duration, including naps nap times for the previous three months. The average sleep durations during weekdays and weekends were recorded separately and the mean duration of sleep per day was calculated. So um, I'm not sure, it sounds to me basically as if they said, uh, just write down how much you slept on average for the past three months. And maybe I'm wrong, maybe they did it, you know, ask them to record it uh, prospectively, like for three months they were asking them to write down how much they slept. That's possible, but it sounds as if they, they did it, like they just asked them like, over the past three months, how much have you slept? Either way, this is of course really, really problematic. That's kind of the first thing I wanna point out from the study is that if you truly wanna look at the association between sleep and anything else, you really cannot use uh, subjective measures because you know we are not very accurate at all when it comes to uh, determining how much we sleep. And we know this from previous journal clubs uh, and from some of the books I've written, et cetera, uh, that if you look at like random people who have no trouble sleeping, they typically overestimate their sleep by an, by an hour. And if, if you look at people who have trouble sleeping, they typically underestimate by an hour. And, and that's just kind of like, that's very broad. If you look at an individual level, I'm sure there's very big uh, uh, discrepancy be between objective sleep time and, um, and actual sleep time on the individual level. So I think number one for me here is like, there's no objective data at all. This is just like asking people how much they slept and believing that that is true. Okay, that was, that was kind of the first thing I want to point out. Now, second thing was this. So they... Um, the, the mean, uh, in the results here, we see that the mean CRP level was 0 0.21 20, milligrams per deciliter. And, and then the question becomes like, okay, um, uh, does that like, you know, how, how did that play out when it came to sleep? So they looked at this in various, in various ways. One was just like the univariate logistic regression analysis, where I think you, the way I interpret it is that you just look at the number and see if there was a correlation but you don't factor in the, the kind of the other things that could have that could have been confounders. So I think I'll just jump into kind of like what I thought was super interesting here, which was that when, where do we, where is the results? Um, it's a little earlier on here, actually. I remember seeing it. Um, okay, right here. Um, Table three shows the results of the multiple logistic and linear regression analysis of factors associated with uh, CRP levels. Where the sleep duration was treated as a continuous predictor, sleep duration was not a significant risk factor for CRP levels using multiple uh, li uh, linear regression after adjusting for the, uh, for the factors listed. So there you have it. There was no, like, sleep was not associated with uh, CRP levels. It, it, it's, it's like, it's, uh, I, I, I'm not surprised at all, actually, by this, because we see this all the time. Like, the actual headline of an article does not match with the actual findings. When, when they treated, okay, so what they saw was that when they treated sleep as a continuous variable, when they said that, you know, we, we look at sleep from like whatever the lowest reported to highest reported was as kind of a continuous, you know, thing, then there was no correlation. However, what they did see was that when they arbitrarily chose a level, they saw that if we, if you, if you think, if we think of sleep as like 
a dichotomous variable where there's like this and that. So we compare less than five and a half hours with more than five and a half hours, and they arbitrarily chose five and a half hours as kind of the normal point. Then they could see some, they could see an association. But I mean, if we think about it, who like sleep is clearly not a, 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 a sleep is a continuous variable. I think that's pretty obvious. It's like height. It's not like you know you can dissect it and this is normal, this is not normal, right? Uh, and so that was kind of so the first, you know, this let's say the second point I wanted to make here was that they actually didn't see the correlation in what I think is the most uh, the, the the way to look for this assertion that makes the most sense. And then um, we have so many other things like even if they had seen such a correlation, there's like, like, what does that even mean? Maybe those people who slept less were stressed because of some reason, right? And maybe that stress was the reason they had high CRP levels, right? So this, this, this is classic example where the headline says one thing and the results say something completely different. Okay. So with that said, we can turn our attention to the other one. And I actually, let's see here. I have to go back into, I, I, I accidentally deleted uh, this link I had here, but the second talk, the second was simply called Sleep and Immune Function by Besadovsky and Lang. So let's look at that, Sleep and Immune Function. Here it is. And now I'm gonna share the screen with you. Okay, share screen. And now we're gonna pick that one. Now this one, I'm not going to spend too much time here, actually, because this this is a this is not a kind of an experimental study that's being reported. This is a um, a literature review, and this is actually we can see here uh, if we if you open the PDF that this is an invited review, which means that the European Journal of Physiology in 2012 invited Luciana Besadovsky and Tanya Lang and John Bourne to review this topic. I said, please, can you review uh, this topic of sleep and immune function? And like, if you're asking somebody to review that and they, and they submit a review that says like, oh, we didn't find anything. There was no correlation between the two. You know, how likely is that to be published? Like how, how happy is the European Journal of Physiology going to be with that type of, um, of review? It's probably not going to get published. So already here, when somebody's inviting someone to review this you can see that there's a bias towards like trying to find something and so they looked at a bunch of studies and i can just like you know you can just read the the first sentence of the abstract says sleep in the security system exert a strong regulatory influence on immune functions there's no reference or anything like that but it kind of clearly sets the tone where where they're where they're intending to go and then in the introduction to over the last 15 years research following is this a systems approach of neuroimmunology has accumulated surprisingly strong evidence that sleep enhances immune defense in agreement with the popular wisdom that sleep helps healing. Uh, this doesn't strike any, this doesn't sound very convincing at all to me. It sort of sounds like somebody's trying to convince you of something without necessarily having much evidence. And the next sentence is like, all of the communication between sleep regulatory networks in the central nervous system and the cells and tissues of the immune system is basically bi bi bidirectional, bidirectional. In this review, we will focus on the role of sleep for proper functioning of the immune system. They're saying it here. We will focus on the role of sleep for proper functioning of the immune system. Again, this is not a this is not an unbiased review. This is somebody who's purposely trying to find evidence that sleep has some role to play when it comes to the immune system. And, and the rest of the, the this article is very much the same. There is very little substance and a lot of words. A lot of words. And um, I, I think to me, um, it, 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 I really find it, um, you know, interesting to see how much attention is paid, which it was in this review on like natural killer cells and how they interact with like uh, lymphocytes and like helper cells and how this influences that. When we have large <laughs> studies, like we have meta-analysis of like 46 million people, this Australian study that came out in 2019 by um, Lack and Lovato, no? Yeah, Lack and Lovato, yeah. Uh, where they saw that people who had insomnia and who didn't have insomnia had the exact same life expectancy. So when we know that, why, why is it so interesting to look at these like minute details of T, t cells in, 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 in some experimental condition when we have seen that that actually doesn't have any impact in kind of the big picture 
so uh, I think to me again, um, again and again and again, we see that there's like, it's, it's kind of an emperor's new clothes type thing. Like there's nothing there. I've still found, not found any evidence. I've not found a single like large randomized, uh, you know, multi-center control study showing that sleep has any significant impacts when it comes to our health uh, at all. So that's uh, that's that. But I, I know this was a little, it was not necessarily uh, a uh, in-depth journal club here where we looked at details, but I, I hope, Susan, that this brought some, some clarity to you and uh, to the rest of the community as well, of course. And with that said, I um, have an interview tomorrow that I'm glad to share with you. It's a success story and actually quite a few of them lined up uh, and, uh, and much more to follow. So yeah. Enough for today. At uh, hope you hope you're doing really well, and thanks for tuning in. See you soon. Bye bye.